information is stored on the Falcon network. Yeah, yeah. The way they do it is they generate snarks. Those snarks uh, get a message, that, uh, and basic that message is sent on chain and stored forever on chain. So, like you basically have a formal proof that a particular piece of data was on chain in a particular point in time on a particular head. Every piece of data on Falcon is stored in 32 gigabyte sectors. Uh, you can look at those as chunks, and each of those chunks basically has a proof on chain that a particular sector was stored. Uh, today, like uh, Falcon has a 16 exabyte of capacity, which is a bunch. Like uh, if you compare that to the growth of like the cloud providers, this is like at least a order of magnitude faster than what the cloud providers had in the beginning. And uh, currently, it's being used by a bunch of like cool entities like the Internet Archive, Org, uh, Berkeley, and so on. So the way it works is that you have like a network of storage providers. Uh, you, you can see like the big blue uh, boxes; those are storage providers. You can imagine that like as a bunch of servers in a rack in a data center, uh, because basically they are like that, and they have just a bunch of like hard drives in, in a rack. Uh, Today, like they also need to do some computing, but I'm not going to go into that. Then you can imagine sectors being stored on these particular storage providers. So you can imagine the sectors being some boxes that you keep like on a shelf in a warehouse. Like the warehouse in this particular case would be the storage provider, and basically the boxes would be like those sectors. In the boxes, you can put like uh, small files, big files. But it's important that when you're writing to the Falcon network, basically when you are storing that box, that the box is full, meaning that like you want 32 gigabytes of data on that particular sector. Now, you can have empty boxes, and when we have empty boxes, those are uh, sectors that are just proving uh, that there is some capacity that is committed. Uh, in the background, what happens is basically you're writing just zeros uh, to Falcon, and because you're just writing zeros, those zeros are not representing any particular piece of data, so that's just committed capacity. But on the cryptography level, you have the same guarantees as you would have with a, a particular uh, data set. It's, but you're now storing just zeros. The way you can think of this is, uh, initially you want to commit capacity, so like you want to onboard to the network, and then you're slowly writing there as you're getting there uh, to uh, to, yeah, basically the, the network. The way this works uh, is you can imagine these drives were nicer on Google presentations. Uh, anyhow, you can imagine CD-ROMs being put into those like cartoon boxes. Uh, why CD-ROMs? Because right now, like you can write only once. So if you have a sector that is a committed capacity, you can basically just write that with real data once. It's going to be comma rewritable. CD-ROM at some point, but currently the cryptography is just on the theoretical uh, level, and like uh, it needs to be implemented. But it's not such a big deal. So like probably like in the next year, like Falcon is going to support also rewriting. Uh, but it's important to understand like the analogy of boxes, shelves in a warehouse, and then CD-ROMs that you're basically putting into those boxes. Uh, is everything okay for the recording? Because it's so dark now. Uh, anyhow, uh, when you, you focus on the sector, what happens is uh, that the sector can like hold multiple files. So you can have like multiple files that you're basically writing on that CD-ROM. Uh, the way that you're addressing those files is through a CID. Uh, and the CID is like the same way that you would uh, basically address a file on IPFS. And in that regard, IPFS and Falcon are the same. So far, we have not touched anything around smart contracts, even though that was the topic of uh, this uh, talk. But uh, I just want to make sure that we have like some base context. Uh, otherwise, like no one is going to get what I'm talking about. Uh, so the, the next question is, do we really need smart contracts? Because so far, we are storing there. We have some proofs on chain. We are able to incentivize a particular entity to store that there for a uh, particular uh, uh, length of time. So like, uh, if a storage provider commits that they are going to store a piece of data for two years, four years, they are going to do it without smart contracts. So why would we need smart contracts? So before I get into that, like, uh, let's just understand like how 
uh, it defers to store data on Falcon and to store data on chain on Falcon. So Falcon, similarly to uh, Ethereum, has like a chain. And storing a particular piece of information on the chain is way more expensive than storing it off-chain. Even though you have proofs that a particular piece of data is off-chain, of course, storing it is off-chain is much more efficient. The reason for that is that you just need to store it in one particular location uh, and you need to generate a proof instead of having to store it on every node that is part of like the network, which is the case with the uh, uh, chain, uh, chain state. So uh, yeah, going back to the off-chain, so basically like you could imagine uh, the current like SAP that uh, I just went through where you have like some CD-ROMs that are like stored on like a particular set of miners. They can have a more or less committed capacity, but ultimately they are storing just one piece of data. You can store it like even on multiple ones, but that's a decision that you make as a storage client. While for the chain state, you're basically storing the same piece of information like on every node. Okay, uh, let's get now into the FEM and why uh, do you even need like smart contracts for uh, for Falcon if you're able to store uh, like there. So if we go through like uh, a few use cases, uh, so w what you want with smart contracts, you want to basically be able to incentivize a particular number of nodes to do a particular activity. So for example, I could create a smart contract that has a pool of 100 fill every day. Let's imagine that fill is uh, 100. That would be like uh, 10,000 bucks or something like that. And you would be distributing that uniformly to like all the storage providers that are able to prove to you that they are storing that particular CID in that particular day. So for example, the requirement could be that you just need to send a proof that you're storing that CID. If that proof is there every day, every 24 hours, there is like a, a contract that gets triggered that is basically distributing based on like all the participants that sent the proof. Uh, that's something you can do with the FEM. That's something you were not able to do before the FEM. Uh, you also want to allow storage providers to borrow from uh, a particular like pool of uh, liquidity uh, based on some characteristics of uh, that storage provider. So storage providers by default have some kind of reputation because they are sending proofs every 24 hours. So basically you're just building like reputation as as they are like doing their normal operation. So you can see whether they are missing challenge windows, whether they are slow, whether they are like uh, terminating sectors, so meaning the, like removing data from their apps and so on. Uh, you can allow them to use the current uh, collateral that they have to leverage further. So basically like uh, giving ownership over something they have today for like an additional leverage that would allow them to grow uh, faster. That's also something you, you're not able to do before, uh, before smart contracts and uh, something that you're able to do with smart contracts. Ultimately, smart contracts just allow you to like interact with that state that is uh, on-chain. And it does have very little to do with the off-chain one other than indirectly. Because when you say, I want this CID to be in this particular sector, uh, it needs to be triggered from like the proof that is actually proving that that CID is in that particular sector. But uh, ultimately, who is storing that off chain, like uh, the smart contract doesn't have much to do with that. Uh, so maybe a use case that I'm super familiar with is what we're building. Uh, we're ultimately building liquid staking for Web3. Uh, before we get into the Web3 part, uh, I'm going to go into the Falcon liquid staking and how it works. Something that I did not mention uh, until now is the fact that every sector also needs to have like a collateral. You need to guarantee that that sector is going to be online for the length of the deal duration that you made. So if you agree that you're going to store that sector for two years, four years, you're basically locking liquidity for the next four years. Uh, guaranteeing that that sector is going to be there. If you make a storage deal, which is basically just putting that CD-ROM in the box, you also agree on a particular deal length and you need to keep like that there on that sector for that length. Of course, you have ways of like terminating deals, but like that's not uh, efficient, neither from the incentive sides, but also uh, you're losing some reputation because potentially uh, 
clients will not want to work with you anymore because like you're just removing data that they thought was written for like that length of the deal. So in the case of Falcon, what we specifically do is we basically allow a set of stickers stick into a pool and we're using the liquidity of those stickers to uh, allow particular storage providers to use that liquidity in order to like back particular sectors. So we are abstracting away completely like uh, all the liquidity for storage providers and we are allowing them to just focus on adding storage and uh, basically proofing sectors every 24 hours. Now, uh, Web3 uh, is a bit more complicated because now like it's not enough that we focus on Falcon. We also need to focus on other networks. And if you like zoom out more broadly what compute is uh, and what Web3 is, like uh, my assumption is that when we say Web3, like there is always a utility involved. So like it cannot be a network like Ethereum. Ethereum is basically just providing the consensus and sure we are using smart contracts. And you could argue that those smart contracts are a utility, sure. Uh, but like uh, when we say Web3, like it needs to be more something like you're doing storage, you're doing encoding, you're doing rendering, you're basically providing a particular utility to the network which is not the consensus. So, uh, yeah, when we focus on compute providers, uh, we uh, also need to like uh, do a similar thing as Falcon, where we need to think who are the personas that will be basically being the custodians of the liquidity, because ultimately some liquidity needs to be uh, locked somewhere. If you think about Lightyear, Lightyear is very similar to Falcon. In the case of Falcon, like the storage providers are holding that liquidity. In the case of Lightyear, you have orchestrators that are holding that liquidity, and based on the amount of liquidity that they have, they are getting like more or less jobs. In a way, it's zero-sum game where you are basically fighting with uh, like other utility providers uh, for the same amount of jobs, and then you have like a big orchestra that is run by the Lightyear team that is basically just adding those jobs to like a shared pool. And from that pool, like a particular set of uh, utility providers are gonna execute that. Other networks that are relatively similar are render network as well and so on. But ultimately it's a compute workload that we also need to take care uh, of. Now this is getting more and more complex. Uh, so yeah, bear with me. Uh, so the way it works is that Ultimately, you have like very different personas. So on one side, you have like uh, folks that are doing like massive storage setups. So they have like racks full of hard drives, uh, and you have like uh, token holders of Falcon that want to stake liquidity into something that generates uh, enough yield for them. Well, on the other side, you have compute providers, and compute providers are very different from storage providers. Like you could imagine a compute provider being something like this, uh, something more like a Ethereum miner rather than like a, a storage provider that is just keeping a bunch of drives in a data center. The compute provider does not need to be reliable, uh, which is a super important piece. And the fact that it does not need to be reliable allows us to basically commodize completely that activity. Meaning that like uh, we are getting to the point where like it's insanely efficient. Like uh, if you let people do mining, they're gonna get super creative on how they are gonna use both electricity, how they are going to cool their equipment, how they are even going to get to that electricity and so on. Because you're allowing them to basically contribute to our open network, which is probably one of the biggest things we have achieved as an as a ecosystem, allowing everyone to contribute to a particular network. While for storage, you need to be reliable and it's super different. Cool. Uh, ultimately, uh, if you just uh, zoom out from this and look at how this actually looks like on a, a practical level, uh, and I'm getting more like on the technical side, uh, is that we have like uh, basically a, a layer two that is talking to Falcon and basically we have like a bunch of compute providers that are able to do uh, a few workloads that are uh, basically being run on other networks. And somehow like we are talking between like all those networks. Uh, ultimately, you have on one side a compute market, and on the other side you have like a, a storage market, and we are trying to coordinate all of that. And all of this would not be possible without like uh, smart contracts on Falcon and like uh, also smart contracts on Ethereum, 
because ultimately all the liquid staking tokens need to live on on a network and uh, the best network for that is of course the network that has the largest liquidity pool which is ethereum so yeah i'm gonna pause here and possibly start wrapping up and uh, taking some questions Questions? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's loud. Um, okay, so my question's about using off-chain state on-chain. Um, mm -hmm. So if you look at the example of NFTs, they talk a lot about how like gaming NFTs would clog up this chain with too much state. We can put it off-chain, but there's no clean way right now to read off-chain state on-chain. You have to use like a chain link external adapter or something. Is FVM doing any work on yeah, reading off-chain state on-chain? Because that would be a huge differentiator. So you want to like read this CID or like? Uh, no, like the actual content itself. Like, if, you, if you, the CID at th that content presumably has a need to be consumed on-chain. And I gave the example of gaming NFTs. This is like a very common mm -hmm. example, but I Sounds no. like the answer to my question is no. If, no, um, but, but the reason why it's no is because like it would cost way too much gas, right? Like you don't want to like process images on chain. Like, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, image is a very bad example. Um, text is like a common example. Uh, yeah, I mean like. Um, yeah, uh, maybe I'm not getting the question, but like uh, I think you can do it like on any network. Like the only question is how you're interacting with that state. So like uh, if you're using like uh, the default node, probably <laughs> the node is gonna die on you. But like, uh, if yeah, but you can't you can't read information on IPFS on chain. No. Yeah, fine. this is the gap. Okay, I, I, the answer to my question is no. So yeah. I'm gonna pass it off to someone else. But you can store a CID and you can just fetch it like. Uh, yes, of course you can. If you're just consuming it as an application, you can fetch it. But the common example is that you can store gaming state off chain in IPFS. But if you need to consume it for some reason in the contract for some on-chain on decision, um, you need to read it from the off-chain state. But yeah, yeah. I'm just going to pass this on to someone else. Next question. OK, thank you, Vuk.